Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah Pierce, and I'm the program assistant at the Natural Areas Association, uh, and I'm your host for the webinars. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation today, time permitting. Please use the chat function, not the Q&A function in Zoom to type your questions during the presentation. Uh, I'll collect those questions and pose them um, verbally to our presenter at the end. Go ahead and test the chat function now, please, by typing in what motivated you to join the webinar today, whether you live within the quarantine area or you're in a neighboring state um, and you're concerned about spotted and lanternfly or you're interested in forest health more generally. So go ahead and, and type in your answers in the chat function now. I will note the Society of American Foresters has approved this webinar for one category one continuing forestry education credit. And I'll be sending a follow up email after the webinar to collect details from anyone interested in, in receiving a CFE. We also offered CFEs for the webinar last week on beech leaf disease. Um, and I will be sending out another email for that as well. We've been dealing with some technical issues with uh, the webinar video from last week, but we'll have it up by the end of tomorrow, hopefully. I'll now say just a little bit about Natural Areas Association as an organization and highlight a few upcoming events. And then I'll hand the webinar over to Sarah Wurzbacher, our presenter today. So the Natural Areas Association is the organization that connects, supports, educates, and advocates for, natural, for the national community of natural areas professionals. We're a 501c3, we're over 40 years old. We provide up-to-date scientific information for natural areas management through webinars like this one, the Natural Areas Journal, which is a peer-reviewed quarterly publication, regional workshops, and our annual Natural Areas Conference. We have a couple of upcoming events this fall. November 3rd, we'll be hosting another webinar with Dr. Vanessa Beecham on wavy leaf basket grass. So stay tuned for details about that. Uh, we also have our conference coming up in October in Pittsburgh. If you haven't registered for the conference, you'll wanna check out the conference program at our website, naturalareas.org. You can also keep an eye out for the webinar announcements on the website as well. If you're not a member of the Natural Areas Association yet, I encourage you to, to, to check us out, talk to a colleague who's a member, um, and learn more about what we can do uh, for you uh, and your professional development. So now I'll just hand the, web, hand the webinar over to Sarah Wurzbacher. She's a Penn State Forestry Extension Educator based in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And she's with us to share information on spotted lanternfly, a non-native invasive insect infesting forests in the northeastern United States. So Sarah, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and, and take it from here. Okay, you should be able to see the first slide. Um, can everyone see the content well and can you hear me all right? Yep, everything's showing up as it should and, and I can definitely hear you, Sarah. Excellent. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat pod, but um, if I miss questions, I'll, I'll mostly take them at the end. So if there's quick things, um, feel free to jump in and I'll, I'll try to address them right away. Um, thank you for introducing me, Sarah. My name is Sarah Wurzbacher. As you said, I work with Penn State Extension um, and Penn State Extension's mission is really to be a link between research and practice um, and provide science based information to practitioners, not just in agriculture, but in the broader economy in Pennsylvania and beyond. Spotted lanternfly is something that first showed up in Pennsylvania and the United States um, and really extension as well as the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture have been leading the charge on trying to mitigate the effects of this pest and prevent its spread. It's something that like many invasive insects is something that we're just going to have to learn to live with and deal with and try our very best to, to prevent um, any, any further damage and further risk factors associated with it. So, it looks like most of you have some, based on what you've said in the chat pod, have some familiarity with this insect. So hopefully I can kind of reinforce some of what you know and introduce a few new concepts. 
All right, so spotted lanternfly is a new invasive insect. It was first discovered in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014, but based on the condition of some of the egg masses that were found there, it's likely that it arrived sometime in 2012. Um, it's native to parts of Asia, and it's currently acting as an invasive species in some other parts of Asia, including Japan and South Korea. In fact, a lot of the early information that we had in terms of how we, uh, Pennsylvania tried to form its, its response to spotted lanternfly came from what we've learned from the Korean literature. Um, the PA Department of Agriculture likes to use this slide to show uh, that Pennsylvania is kind of right there within the, the latitude ranges of, of spotted lanternfly's native range and areas where it's currently invasive. So its known distribution now is beyond southeastern Pennsylvania. Like I said, it started in Berks County, but it's expanded quite a bit uh, its range. So what you see in this map are a couple of different pieces of information. The, any of the areas that appear in blue here, again, centered on southeastern Pennsylvania, but inclusive of some other states, as well as one little satellite area here in Virginia, is an established infestation of spotted lanternfly. We know it's there and there's likely, you know, people are, are dealing with it every day. Anywhere on this map that you see yellow, in some of these uh, satellite counties in, in a number of different states, there have been individuals discovered, but not a, a, a really um, well-developed infestation. So likely what's happened in some of those states have been someone has positively identified a dead adult in, in many cases, uh, and the Department of Ag or USDA has gone in and done a thorough investigation and not found um, a, a well-developed infestation there. So it's not considered part of the current distribution, even though observations have, been, have happened in those areas. The other important piece of information on this map uh, is this, these red lines. And anywhere you see a red line on this map indicates a current regulatory quarantine associated with this insect. And so there are regulatory implications dependent on the state for what that uh, quarantine really means. And we'll talk a little bit in more detail about quarantine information um, as we go on here. So uh, in Pennsylvania, the distribution to just to zoom in again on that same blue area of the map that we just looked at, uh, I like this map a little bit better because it gives you a sense of what kinds of cities and transportation corridors and commerce and huge population centers are within the current range of spotted lanternfly. And wherever people are moving, invasive species also tend to move. So that's why it's kind of a, you know, all, all hands on deck type situation to try to deal with this insect because there's a lot of people moving in and out of this area. And our attempts are really to try to educate the public and practitioners about not moving this thing around. Um, what you see on the left side there is a list of, of currently quarantined areas or, or areas where uh, management is taking place. So since I work in Pennsylvania and, and we work closely with the P Department of Ag, which I'll probably refer to as PDA throughout this uh, presentation, this is the current quarantine in 14 counties in Pennsylvania right now. So let's dig into the life cycle of this insect. The most important thing uh, to, to re remember with this insect uh, in the way that we manage it, the way we deal with it, it's one generation per year. So we don't have overwintering adults. Instead, uh, the adults will focus in around this starting this time of year, but into December on laying eggs, egg masses, which will then overwinter and hatch out. Uh, these individuals will move through a couple of different life stages called instar nymphs, and they look very similar. They just molt and get larger in the first three life stages uh, where they're kind of a, a little, they look like little leaf hoppers. Um, that's in fact exactly what they are. They're black with little white spots. They get larger as they molt through the year. And then the fourth instar is very showy uh, with red and a little bit of yellow coloration, but it retains those white spots and it's a bit larger until finally it advances into adulthood and then can fly. So these are all hoppers. Um, these can hop around as well, but they are also flyers, uh, which then they commence with egg laying. And that's, the, that's the, the long and short of the life cycle. So let's drill down a little bit into the individual life stages. So this is a close up of what that first to third instars really look like. Um, again, they're just, they're kind of cute. They're little hoppers. Um, and uh, and these, these distinctive white dots on their back are, are really easy to identify. There's a lot of, um, a very high positive identification rate for spotted lanternfly because even in the nymph stages, because it's a very distinctive insect. 
Uh, and this is what that fourth instar looks like pretty close up. Again, this is going to be larger than the previous instars and it's going to be really showy. Um, you're probably, if you're in the quarantine right now, you're probably still seeing some of these, um, but most of them are starting to, to move on into the adult life stage now. But this is kind of the time of year when people really start to notice them, uh, because how can you not notice them? They're, they're very showy. So the adults, again, uh, from July to December, um, you might see multiple life stages at one time. That's important to note. The adults are the most, um, I would say, the, the, the most obvious in terms of positive identification. So when they're at rest, they're, they're about an inch, inch long, inch and a half wide when at rest. The wings are kind of a mauve, semi-translucent color. Um, so you can see some of the red um, wings underneath the, that overwing there uh, with this kind of like really elegant lattice pattern here at the back and these spots all along the wings. Um, and just the look, once you start to look at one or two of these, you get a sense of what the shape of the insect is and kind of where you look for it, how it moves around. Um, and so this is really kind of pretty textbook for, for what it's going to look like. When they're alarmed or when they're flying, uh, they'll, they'll unfurl their wings and you can see this red patterning at the back, which is very, very distinctive. So very, very easy to identify the adults. Um, in the late season, during egg laying time and mating behaviors, you will likely see very large numbers of this insect at one time. Certainly, where there are high densities of nymphs, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of them in one place, but this kind of characteristic swarming behavior where you see tons and tons of them on one tree, those are often the pictures that you might see in, in media. Um, or shared on Facebook or, or shared from, you know, from in, invasive species councils uh, and, and PDA. This is really the key kind of late season behavior that adults engage in. And so the egg laying female will, um, will congregate on, on stems and, and lay row, vertical rows of eggs here. I'm pointing at my screen, you can't see that. <laughs> vertical rows of eggs here and then cover it with a waxy substance that protects it from the elements. Um, sometimes they're not so great at covering them up, so you'll see some exposed egg lines, lines of eggs, and some with that waxy coating over them. Um, but it's important to note that when this is fresh, it has a very different appearance than when it starts to kind of crack and dry and overwinter. So when it's very fresh, it's kind of a whitish substance, which kind of dulls to gray and then eventually cracks and looks almost like mud splatter. So this is what a line of these egg masses looks like. So a pregnant female can have up to 200 eggs in a year. We initially thought it was one female, one egg mass, but it, um, it looks like more like it's, she, she's certainly capable of multiple egg masses per year. It's something we've learned in the early years of the infestation. So a female may lay 30 to 50 eggs in one egg mass. And again, she, uh, she's laying multiple egg masses per year. It's important to note that when we think about egg masses, we often really think about where they appear on trees or in forests. But egg, these egg masses are, they'll lay eggs anywhere. Um, they seem to really like rusty metal. They like um, dead wood. They like picnic tables. They like plastic. Um, so anywhere that there is a solid surface, stone, for example, um, they, they will lay eggs there. And when you do see them on trees, it can be anywhere on the tree. So here you see them congregated at the base of the stem, but they may also be in the high parts of the canopy as well. So this is kind of a, a good visualization of, first of all, the fact that not all of these eggs got covered. Um, so only some of this egg mass was successfully covered by that waxy coating. Uh, and this is what that fresh appearance looks like in November. And then after overwintering, and this is still before uh, they've hatched out, likely. Um, I'm not sure what, what this precise location geographically, but it's very likely these haven't hatched out yet. It doesn't look like they have from the picture. Um, this is the appearance of it in March. So certainly egg masses are easier to identify at some parts of the year than, than others because this looks like, boy, that could be anything. It looks like a mud splatter. Um, and that's often really a really challenging part of, of mitigation is, is positive identification of an egg mass infestation. So, uh, so that kind of reviews the life cycle. Again, it's one generation per year. In terms of the behavior of this insect, the key issue with spotted lanternfly and the way that it behaves and everything that its life is about is about sap sucking. 
it's not a biting or stinging insect. And even though it does kind of swarm and it's a nuisance species in that way, um, it, there's not, it's not harmful to human health. And that's an, that's an important thing people really want to know. Um, so the key thing here is this piercing sucking mouth part, this proboscis. Um, so it'll hop onto a stem, kind of punch that in like a straw and feed uh, through the living tissue of the plant on the plant sugars. Why this is important? Because it's a sap sucking insect, it, well, not because it's a sap sucking insect, but along with being a sap sucking insect, it's also a feedstock agnostic insect. So it will feed on a very wide range of species. We know of about 70 or more plants that it will feed on. Uh, you've probably, if you've heard of spotted lanternfly, you've also heard of Ailanthus altissima or tree of heaven. It's an invasive tree that it seems to really, really love to feed on. But it's not, it doesn't only feed on that one stem. So this is the first kind of misconception that I think a lot of people have about spotted lanternfly. It will feed on almost any of these 70 species. Um, but some of the ones that it tends to really like that are not Ailanthus include black walnut, grape, so wild grape and also cultivated grape, hops, apple trees, maple, other um, fruit bearing trees, birch, sycamore, willow, staghorn sumac. There's a very, very long list. Um, I would say just observationally, I'm seeing it a lot more on maple than I used to, or maybe I'm just hearing more about it and there's more positive IDs. Um, so it's, it's really kind of going for a lot of different things. It's important too to note that the feed, the feeding preferences of this insect change depending on its life cycle. So in the very early season, we see nymphs focusing more on tender stems. Um, and often a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, vines with higher, higher trigger pressure, there's, you know, more, we, we have a sense that maybe they may be more passive feeders. So they depend on the pressure in the plant to kind of help them drink sap. Um, and also treat, you know, tree of heaven and grape, it'll go to those any time of year. Uh, but toward the end of the year, they, they will gravitate more toward uh, the larger stems, willow, river birch, maples. Um, and in the late season, we see a very strong preference for tree of heaven as well. So it's just important to note. And this is kind of, there's a lot more work ongoing on this. Something you'll hear me say a lot during this presentation is that there's a lot of unanswered questions and we're still doing as much research as we can to try to, to answer that. I, I see a note, uh, porcelain berry, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a, there's a very long, long list of, of options here. Uh, China berry is another uh, quite important one. So uh, when these insects are feeding on the sap from the stem, they are actually not very efficient users of that sugar. And so what you end up with is, is a huge amount of production of something called, what we euphemistically call honeydew, but it really is just sugary rich insect poop, basically. So I want you to watch a very short video here of the feeding behavior of spotted lanternfly in a vineyard. So, whoops. Okay, here we go. So what you should be able to see are, if it's moving, um, you'll see insects kind of moving around on this plant. And if you focus kind of up here, you'll see a little bit of kind of dripping stuff going on. And this individual right there is currently excreting honeydew in the video progress. Um, something I want you to note, you know, where, where are these on the stem? Are they feeding on the grapes themselves? They're not. Um, they're feeding on the stem and they're, they're, they're going after, again, the, the plant phloem. So they're, they're not really going to go munch on all of these lovely grapes, but what they are going to do is produce this honeydew that will get sticky sap all over these grapes. Um, why is that problematic? Why does that cause uh, yield losses in grape? It's really just a superficial issue. Well, when that sticky sap is deposited, it's the perfect growth medium for sooty mold. So the sooty mold will grow on that crop of grapes or apples or whatever, and those are now non-marketable, non-viable, that crop is lost. So there are, are demonstrated yield losses in grape and apples due to the sooty mold deposition. And also just the fact that any kind of feeding behavior like that is going to stress the plant. So those are kind of the two mechanisms by which we see damage and yield loss. Um, this sooty mold deposition is not important, not just for how it impacts plants, but how it impacts quality of life issues for people. So this photo here on the right shows somebody's front steps and they've pressure washed this bottom step after a lot of deposition of honeydew and subsequent sooty mold growth. 
and they haven't so, uh, pressure washed these other ones. So you can kind of get a sense of, of just how bothersome that would be for you if this was your front steps. You'd have to deal with that all the time. And even after pressure washing, they didn't even quite get all of that sooty mold off. So it really kind of underscores the quality of life issue too that this insect um, presents. So in terms of damage and risk, uh, what you'll see on stems are weeping wounds where those, uh, that proboscis has gone in to, to drink sap like a straw, which caused some like oozing along the stem. The stress response of the tree, you might see leaf, leaf curl. Uh, in, I, I've seen some branch dieback on black walnut, uh, some wilting and overall signs of tree stress. Anytime we talk about trees being stressed, um, anything that stresses a new tree or stresses a tree that has a new stressor or as a significant stressor may also kind of unlock or unleash other stressors that are already latent in the stem or in the environment. So you may see mortality that may not be directly related to spotted lanternfly, but it's a contributing factor. Uh, and again, there's yield losses in apple and grape, and I don't have estimates on that right now today, but that's an ongoing subject of study. There's some concern about the possibility of uh, transmission of pathogens, either directly being brought from the lanternfly from tree to tree, or just through that open wound, that oozing, um, weeping wound. And of course, where sooty mold is being deposited, um, there's a decreased photosynthesis on that stem, which is an additional stressor on top of the feeding behavior. From an economic perspective, you know, I don't have to underline just how valuable a lot of the things that are currently being attacked by spotted lanternfly are. Grape, apple, peach industries, nursery and landscape stuff, um, forest products. So Pennsylvania is the, the number one exporter of hardwoods in the United States. Um, so, you know, it, it's pretty obvious, like it's, it's something we got to think about and, and worry about. Um, and for those of you who work more on the business side of things, and you may care just as much um, as for the ecological issues as for the economic issue of the, the possibility that if we don't really institute some, some pretty robust biosecurity practices, trade may be shut down with states that have spotted lanternfly inf uh, infestations, and, and that really decreases the opportunities for, for cross-state um, and international trade. So uh, I mentioned that in the late season, uh, spotted lanternfly really tends to show preference for, for certain areas, and I hinted at this kind of swarming behavior. So just to underline the what's at risk for, for a lot of these commodity crops, um, and in fact, our, our focus has very much been on, on apples and grapes and, and those types of crop issues. Uh, these spotted lanternfly were not present at this site in the morning when this um, orchard grower walked out and looked at his, his, his trees and thought, wow, I've got a really wonderful crop of apples this year, looks pretty good. Um, and that afternoon he went out and found this and had to go call the PDA plant inspector back and say, you gotta come back here and look for it again because it wasn't there when you were here this morning, but it's there now. So that's kind of how quickly they can descend on an area and the impact that they can have. So in the later season, uh, this kind of swarming behavior tends to happen much more strongly. And we see this really strong preference for certain host species. Again, Alanthus is one, um, grape is another, apples, um, maples in some cases. So uh, what we have here, you'll see this kind of like huge army of, of lanternfly kind of suddenly appear in, in one place. Um, these are some dead lanternfly that have fallen down someone's chimney. They're just there in really high abundance. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of videos that will really gross you out. So uh, this gentleman just walked up to a tree near an airport and just kind of, again, they're not a stinging or biting insect, so they're not going to hurt this guy, but boy, it's pretty gross. Um, and then here, this is that same apple orchard where we saw the swarming behavior in that previous photo that I mentioned. Um, and there, there they go. So, you know, they're, they're all over that. Um, and they, they tend to kind of choose some stems that they really prefer over others, even of the same species, even at the same site. So um, it's, we don't know exactly why that happens, but uh, it does. And so this, this kind of surge, and surge of late season movement is reflected too, and we have a call center on, on, hey, what the heck is this thing? I think this is spotted lanternfly. And we see this huge peak uh, right around now, actually, um, starting in this late season, that people are, are going online and looking for information or calling us to say what the heck is going on. So um, that's just kind of a funny little, little piece of data. 
This late season movement too is reflected in some of the field data for um, attempts to, to target this individual through systemic insecticide applications. Um, really high spikes again at that critical time of year. The, the days when these data are, are showing that it's low abundance, it was just raining that day and they weren't very active. So again, like their behavior from day to day can be drastically different, which is a, a management challenge for us uh, to consider. Um, here we see the observation of the number of red uh, SLF on, on red maple trees peaks really high on this one day after uh, you know a number of days of yeah we're seeing some but boy a bunch of them showed up that day and so on these red maples you can see the uh, the incidence of egg masses there um, and just just how many visited so when we think about the management challenge of spotted lanternfly. Uh, we have to try to, we, you know, a blunt force instrument of, of just smash them when you see them is always great, uh, but to try to do this a little more systemically and a little bit more elegantly, we have to try to think about what its life cycle is, what its behavior is, and kind of hack those uh, in order to, to come up with a really good strategy. So it's kind of a five-part system here. Number one thing to do is to try to stop the spread of the insect. So the, the main way that this is being done is through a, a, a regulatory quarantine. In Pennsylvania, what the Department of Agriculture's quarantine means is that no one may intentionally move any viable life stage of spotted lanternfly. And the places that we, we tell people to look for these are on, on items that are stored outdoors, vehicles, equipment, um, especially like horse trailers where you have open areas, right? So they can come in and lay egg masses on the inside or on hard goods, firewood, nursery stock. Um, these are all issues, right? But the, the, think about this vehicles too, because the egg masses don't have to be on, on plant material, the egg masses can be on, a, on the side of a train, they can be um, on some rocks that you're moving around, right? Or in the under, undercarriage of your, your car. Um, this is why it's so challenging. The regulatory quarantine has different implications for businesses versus individuals, but everyone should be focusing on these kind of high risk areas. It's always a concern to move a living life stage of spotted lanternfly around. They can kind of hop on to vehicles like this and, and you know, you're never going to be sure that you got all of them off of this tire before you move it to a new site. Um, so that's, that's a challenging situation right there. But the, I would say that the largest danger is unintentionally moving egg masses. Um, these egg messes, again, can kind of be anywhere. And if you, if you don't see them, you can move them without knowing. And, and if, again, if you're not familiar with spotted lanternfly, you wouldn't even necessarily know that that's an egg mess and not just a, a splatter of something. So a lot of the uh, biosecurity practices are like, you know, don't park under a bunch of ailanthus trees or on the tree line or leave your windows shut uh, when you're parked in, in, inside the quarantine so you're not accidentally getting a, a hitchhiker. Um, checking your, your clothing before getting in the car. They, when they're swarming, they can kind of fly up uh, into your clothing. Um, so in that swarming behavior, it's just a really challenging environment. So the, the look before you leave campaign is to try to get people to think consciously about um, searching for these insects if they are moving either within or, beyond, or across quarantine boundaries. And it's probably a good idea to do even if you live slightly outside the quarantine. So for residents, um, this resource is available on our site as well as PDA's site. It gives you like a little checklist. If you know you're going to be moving across quarantine boundaries or within the quarantine, you can kind of do a, a thorough search for individuals and for egg masses. If you're a business, though, there's a, a permit that is required to uh, operate within the quarantine or across quarantine boundaries. And increasingly, um, even if you are, if you have anything to do with the quarantine area, if you're moving things across state lines, it's, it's really quite important. And, and, and there are checkpoints uh, sometimes at the state line or sometimes within the states to make sure that, that you're a permit holder. So this is a, a free thing to do. It takes a couple of hours. By doing this webinar, you probably will already know most of the stuff that's in that. Uh, there's a very quick test and then you're issued a, a permit. Uh, this is again for Pennsylvania and some other states have other um, other trainings and, and other requirements, but, but this is a good example of one. For you working in natural areas, if you're a landowner or if you're a manager of a natural area, um, this is something to consider for the practitioners that you work with, for technical service providers um, who might be doing business in other parts of the state, insist that they're permitted and, tra permitted and trained so they're not unintentionally moving something uh, onto your site. 
So uh, the other thing is to deal with those egg masses. How do we do that? Uh, the number one thing to do is to simply scrape them off. So uh, taking a, a stick or a credit card or something and scraping that egg mass from the top down. So starting at the top here, and you can see the eggs kind of getting smooshed out of this. Uh, drop it into some sort of receptacle with, um, with alcohol in it, so hand sanitizer or whatever. Um, and then you can dispose of this by throwing it away, or I suppose you could burn it, but it's, it's in alcohol, they're, they're non-viable. You can also just smash the egg masses if you're dealing with tons and tons of them and scraping them individually is too daunting a task. Um, but anything you can do to make those eggs non-viable. It sounds futile. It sounds like a blunt instrument to scrape 30 eggs at one time, but even a short effort doing this can have a large impact on private land when your management options might be more limited. So if you consider, if you wanted to work for half an hour and you scrape an egg mass every five seconds, you've killed 15,000 spotted lanternfly. So this is actually, I think, a really interesting volunteer program idea. And on, on natural areas, um, this is a, a, you have a, a good opportunity to do this, right? So the other key thing to remember about egg masses is you don't have to hurry up and do this like as they're being laid. You have all winter to do egg mass mitigation. There's no, gonna be no new egg masses laid after the adults have died. Uh, you just wanna make sure you get to these before uh, they're hatching out. So you have a lot of time to do this. And conversely, for biosecurity, if you're doing an inspection on a vehicle or something and you do one really thorough inspection in January, let's say, um, that, that vehicle's good. Uh, you don't have to re-inspect it in February. There's not gonna be new egg masses there. So uh, again, when you're scraping eggs, you wanna look not just on trees but, or on deadwood, but you wanna look on hard stuff. Um, so uh, stone, um, you know, I already gave you that list. Uh, it could be almost anywhere. You wanna look under the car, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Department of Ag has, has found that chipping to one inch will uh, successfully disrupt egg masses. So chipped material is safe to move and they recommend chipping deadwood, but this is where um, I'm gonna put my forester hat back on and say, please don't chip all the deadwood in your natural areas. Um, consider the function of deadwood features and the value of retention on the landscape. So, you know, in this picture, uh, these coarse woody debris features have really important habitat implications. They're acting as structure uh, in, the, in the forest and they're also acting as structure in the stream. So consider again, weigh your, your risks and your benefits in terms of whether um, reducing uh, coarse woody debris is really a good idea or not. You know, this, this picture kind of underlines the fact that yes, egg, egg masses can be laid under bark, but uh, that flaking bark is also really important wildlife structure. So uh, consider your objectives before you take, take on any of those types of actions. Um, the other non-chemical option you may consider is, a, is tree banding. So uh, this, this PDA is kind of recommending doing this in the spring because banding tends to be much more effective against, uh, at catching nymphs. Um, some of the bands aren't sticky enough to capture adults. Um, there's varying levels of stickiness and there are some DIY options that you can do in terms of banding. Again, those resources are available on our website to tell you how. Um, you're gonna wanna check those frequently, especially if you are in an area with a high infestation because they'll just fill up basically. Um, what this is kind of tapping into is the behavior of the nymphs to walk up and down the stems of trees and they'll just be captured on those sticky bands. This is a really good, another really good volunteer program idea and works fairly well um, uh, on private lands where we're more broadly things, right? Um, so I see one quick question about banding. Uh, can you, do we band only tree of heaven or are more trees? I would say if you're seeing a lot of nymphs on any stem, band it. The banding won't harm the tree. Um, one issue that some people have identified with banding is that bycatch is possible. So, um, yep, somebody just asked about that. So bycatch is possible, but rare. Um, there are some non-target organisms, mostly insects, that will be captured on bands. Uh, but I know of a few cases of birds, uh, at least one case of a bat, which is really sad, um, and at least one case of a very unfortunate squirrel. So um, again, these, th those are rare instances. And if you're doing a large scale banding program, 
um, some of these sort of covering options might not be as, vi as reasonable to consider, but if you're just banding a few stems or doing volunteer programs, there are different options for how to, how to um, alter your bands or do shorter, smaller bands and by, by sort of cutting them lengthwise and breaking them up on the stem so they're much less likely to, to catch larger individuals, um, uh, non-target individuals. And again, you just want to weigh the risk of bycatch um, against the benefits of doing banding and the, and the risk of further spotted lantern fly invasion or impact. The main thing that we want to do is really focus in on Tree of Heaven. As I said, Tree of Heaven is a preferred host species. It's not the only host species, but especially in that late season, they show a really strong preference for it. So um, the, uh, this is the preferred host and it requires herbicide for effective removal. I know that may be a controversial thing to say, but it absolutely requires herbicide um, in the absence of, of other health issues like verticillium, there's a certain verticillium wilt that will affect it. Um, but if you're just dealing with a ton of tree of heaven, you really need to use herbicide to get rid of it. Identifying it is quite easy. Um, this bark looks kind of like a cantaloupe. In the late season and in over the winter, it will retain these clusters of Samara on the female trees. There are both male and female trees that are very, very easy to, to pick out. Um, the inner, uh, the pith is kind of this dark peanut butter color and in fact kind of smells like rancid peanut butter. That's, that's what it says in the literature and it's very true. Um, and the main thing is that on these large compound leaves, they're smooth margins, but they have a little kind of tooth at the bottom here. So that's very easy to, to differentiate from black walnut and sumac and things that are fine to keep around. For removing tree of heaven, um, I, again, I can't stress enough how important it is to use an herbicide. If you don't use an herbicide, it will re-sprout very aggressively from the base. Um, cut stump herbicide treatments are also not effective for tree of heaven. What you need is the retranslocating behavior of the stem to move that chemical underground and into the root system to kill the entire tree, not just what's above ground. So if it's a smaller stem, you could consider uh, a foliar application of glyphosate or uh, triclopyr or a combination thereof. But for, and for small stems that are a bit larger and out of reach for a foliar application, you could do a basal bark treatment. Um, or for really large stems, hack and squirt, where you're directly introducing chemical into the, the growing tissue of the plant in a very targeted and precise way. Um, for the most part, our recommendations are, for, are to use triclopyr for this. Um, one thing I also want to mention is once you kill it, once you introduce herbicide to that stem, wait until it's dead before you cut it, because otherwise you remove the mechanism for it to move the chemical down into its system. So at least wait 30 days, but if it's in the woods or if it's away from structures and you don't mind it falling down, just, just leave it. Okay, uh, so uh, trap tree strategy. This is probably the most elegant uh, integrated pest management option we have right now for spotted lanternfly. As I said, spotted lanternfly tend to show preference for, for tree of heaven in the late season and for individual stems within a community of tree of heaven in the late season. So if this was your property and these were all tree of heaven trees, uh, what you would do is kind of look at the stems that were A, male trees and not producing tons and tons of Samaras, and two, uh, trees that show that for which these lanternfly really showed preference. So then you would reduce the population of tree of heaven by using those herbicide recommendations, like I said, and removing uh, the non-preferred trees as well as the female trees and retaining uh, maybe 10 to 15% of the Elantha stems uh, on the landscape. In the late season, then treating this uh, trap tree with a systemic pesticide like imidacloprid or dinotefuran, and then these uh, lanternfly would congregate at that tree, feed on this tree, ingest the insecticide, and die. Um, this is a proven to be a very, very effective strategy. Um, this is an image taken very shortly after um, these lanternfly found a treated trap tree. Um, the, the best part about this strategy is that there are very, very few native or non-target insects that will also feed on tree of heaven. So it's a very targeted way to focus on just spotted lanternfly. So this is for, for those of you who have larger properties and have a lanthus, um, this is actually a really good option. Contact insecticides, there's a very long list of recommendations and I'm gonna kind of let you um, 
peruse these uh, resources online at your leisure. I won't go through all of them, but there's a lot of uh, recommendations that we have. We've been trying to do a lot more trials, uh, eff effectivity trials for homeowners. All of these are accessible to homeowners, um, and they're in this resource uh, entitled Spotted Lantern Fly Management for Homeowners, which also talks a bit about banding. Uh, but we also have a more, more technical resource for land, um, landscape professionals, and many of you will probably be um, in this situation where, where you, you would make more sense of this information, uh, which talks a bit about toxicity levels, um, application methods, and recommended timing of applications um, as well. So when I think about the key issues for forests and natural areas, you know, we're seeing some branch dieback and we're seeing some stress. Um, I kind of focus on the following issues. First of all, sooty mold deposition, where we have large amounts of spotted lanternfly in forests uh, and, and green space, that sooty mold deposition on the understory and mid canopy is really, really important. Anyone who's dealing with deer or other forest health issues uh, knows that the quality of your regeneration is everything when you're thinking about sustainable forestry and future options for management in the stand. So anything that's going to stress that understory vegetation and specifically desirable regeneration is hugely problematic. Um, regenerating trees can take less stress than established overstory trees. So that continued sooty mold deposition is going to be an issue for decreasing photosynthetic capacity of understory stems, which are already usually very shaded. SLF as an additional stressor. As I said, when trees are stressed and any one thing kills a tree, it's not always that last thing that hit it. May, you know, who cares what the actual final blow was from. Uh, the fact is there's usually a complex of stressors that are impacting a tree by the time it is killed by something. So here on the bottom right are a few photos of, of, road, of street side maples that are um, currently undergoing stress from a verticillium wilt, not the same one that affects um, uh, Atlantis, but a different one. So um, this wilt was probably present in the tree. It's probably not a, a huge deal, but these, this stress from the verticillium only showed up after very heavy feeding by SLF. So one stressor makes a plant susceptible to the next stressor. And I think that that's really kind of the critical uh, place that spotted lanternfly has in terms of forest management. The, we have to consider too what its preferences are. So if it's targeting certain species that we really like um, for timber value like black walnut, for, um, for wildlife value like wild grape, a lot of foresters don't like wild grape, but wildlife biologists love the stuff because it's an excellent wildlife species for soft mass. Um, and again, those understory conditions too. If they're hitting understory uh, trees, they may be reducing the the overall diversity of stems in, in that area. You may be losing things like witch hazel or, or dogwood or something like that. Quality of life too. Um, this is really important to me and probably those of you who work in natural areas because people don't need any more reasons not to go in the woods. You know, I talk to a lot of people who say, oh, I, I just don't want to go in the woods anymore because of ticks. I don't want to go any, in the woods anymore because of XYZ. And it's, if you're in a forest that is infested by spotted lanternfly, they're flying into your face and they're excreting honeydew onto your head and it's, it's not a pleasant place to walk around. So um, I, I consider that a quite an important issue. And of course, all of the unanswered questions we have. Uh, are the, the weeping wounds a secondary infection site for other forest health issues? Will they cause wood quality problems in the future? We simply don't know the answers to those questions. A lot of the forests in the southeastern part of the state are quite invaded and not contiguous and highly fragmented. So it's hard to, to look at them as a representative of what the rest of the state or the rest of the region might be facing. But uh, some of the research is, is focusing very much on these stressors to try to, to answer those questions. But um, we there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So I'm gonna zero in on just a, a few of the ongoing research projects. And a lot of these are kind of preliminary, but I think it's important for people to know what's being worked on. There's a, you can read faster than I can talk, but there's quite a long list of, of issues that uh, folks at, at Penn State and USDA, at PDA and in other states are really focusing on. Um, so I'm gonna talk about just a few of these. In terms of a trapping potential, so we know that, that these lanternfly have a preference for certain stems over others, even of the same species, even at the same site. Um, so are they being attracted to something? 
um, using a, a lure, we found really no effect of a lure on adults or nymphs in Redding, and then adults again at another trial in Winchester, Virginia. So as far, based on the where the research is now, there's not really uh, much optimism in terms of using a lure type trap for this insect. To me, the biggest question that people ask us is, does lanternfly require a lanthus? So I said that it was a preferred host, uh, not a, the only host, but we still do not know whether Atlantis is required for the full life cycle development of the insect. Here's the study that happened last year, um, last season. So there were two enclosures, one uh, that had willow, red maple, black walnut, river birch, and one that had all of the same plus Atlantis. And into those two cages, uh, uh, replicated of course, um, spotted lanternfly were, were released. So um, on day two, we started with 84 nymphs in each cage. This was a really interesting uh, project that was headed up by Kelly Hoover at Penn State. So if we look at the enclosures that had Alanthus and the enclosures that did not have Alanthus, we saw very similar patterns of survivorship for, for all of the, the, the instars, the nymphs and in instars, right? So, uh, but then changes happened for adults. So um, the maximum number of adults was 56 with Alanthus, which began to decline on August 14th. And without Alanthus, the maximum of 43 adults began to decline around August 12th. So that decline happened at the same time of year. Um, and the final live adult lived till November 22nd in the Alanthus enclosure. And the final live adult uh, that died, um, died on October 6th without Alanthus. So that you might think to yourself, well, that really indicates that probably, um, you know, these adults are, are, are dying more quickly, they really need Alanthus and they're stressed without it. What I read from that is, I'm it's amazing that that survivorship lasted that long without Alanthus. And when we look at the number of egg masses laid, we see that, you know, the egg masses were really focused in late October. Um, so because we lost individuals from the, the non-Alanthus enclosures, maybe they didn't have an opportunity to lay those egg masses um, just because they died. And that may happen because of the lack of Alanthus, but that may have also happened because these stems were small stems, they were potted plants. And again, like I said, they may be passive feeders. This turgor pressure and the sap flow of these plants is quite important. So we can't definitively say from this research project that Alanthus is required for reproductive success in this insect. Instead, what we need is a larger scale trial. So the next steps by this group of researchers was this happened this year. And of course, it's, it's still early days because we have to wait for the full life cycle to go through November or December. Uh, but we have larger enclosures, uh, larger trees, and hopefully we can, um, we can answer those questions. So predators, this is kind of the, the thing that's getting a lot of press these days. Um, what's going to eat this stuff, right? There are generalist predators that will affect spotted lanternfly, but it's very unlikely to control the population. Um, assassin bugs, spiders, um, praying mantids, uh, they're, they're low levels of predation. We actually see, um, you know, chickens eat anything. Chickens will take one bite of a spotted lanternfly and spit it on the ground. Um, it's, not, it's not preferred. It's not being um, uh, eaten by birds. It's um, not something people like, that chickens like, or people, I suppose. Parasitoids. So the, the key, th um, there are a few key parasitoids that we're interested in. Endemically, the, this parasitoid wasp that affects gypsy moth here in, in uh, Pennsylvania in the region, um, does parasitize egg masses, but only about 7% and only attacks about 20% of the egg masses that it encounters. So there is some level of parasitism from this native uh, species, but not at very high levels, and it's highly localized where it's having an impact. Um, researchers are looking abroad for parasitoids, for foreign parasitoids in the native range of, of spotted lanternfly in China uh, with higher although more variable rates of parasitism. Um, so this one is one that affects um, uh, eggs, egg it's an egg parasitoid. 
and another that attacks second and third instars. Um, and so, and again, 40% parasitism, that's higher than, than a lot of what we're seeing, right? But for both of these, because they are also non-native species, very reluctant to just release them, right? So they're in quarantine and under research. Um, and so those, are, those options are out there, but they need a lot more study before we're prepared to release them. This is the big ticket item that everyone's been hearing about in the news, um, the fungal pathogens affecting spotted lanternfly. So the two uh, that are currently observed to kill spotted lanternfly are a Bovaria species um, and a Batcoa species. So the Bovaria species is, um, uh, is usually, um, is this one here, it, it just, this is what it looks like. And the Batcoa species uh, ends up looking like this. Um, these ones, the Batcoa basically has it climb the tree like a zombie and then um, the, it sporulates and, and the, the fungal pathogen can, can move in the landscape. These ones, they usually fall to the ground and die. There are, um, the, the, for the Batcoa, the observational trial showed high mortality, but it's really a, just one site that we found this. Um, so it's very hard to say what the, um, what the implications for management are going to be at this point. Um, right now, the Batcoa can't really be cultivated in a lab to be released. Um, there are commercial formulations of the Bovaria um, fungus, and they, it, in the trials that are happening at Penn State, they're using air blast handguns and field trials, and they're seeing um, mortality, especially in third and fourth instars. So far this year, again, adults are, it's kind of happening now, um, and it's reduced populations, but there are some non-target organisms, and it's hard to say kind of what, what the implications for control are going to be. What we know now is that it's there, it's in the landscape, but the, um, the implications for management and the promise for this as a broad scale control are probably, that's probably a little bit too optimistic right now based on what we know. So the best thing is really vigilance to, at any given time, you know what the life stages are, you know when they're going to be appearing, sometimes simultaneously. Uh, if you see one, take a photo of it or capture the individual um, and report it. So uh, the, if you're in Pennsylvania, to report a sighting of spotted lanternfly, you can go to this extension site or contact the hotline and you'll be talked through the process. It's very important to report them outside of the quarantine. If you're in the quarantine, PDA knows it's there. Um, but this website here too has a lot of the resources that I mentioned, tree of heaven control, um, banding implications, uh, landowner and um, landscape professional recommendations for contact and pesticides. Uh, pretty much everything I talked about and much, much more is available there. So um, this is my contact information if you want to reach out to me. I'm a, sort of a foot soldier. I'm not the, in the vanguard of the researchers, but I can certainly get you in touch with someone if you have a very specific question or if it's uh, more on the general side of things, then absolutely I can, I can answer those questions. So I'm happy to take your questions now. I'll leave this up because uh, I think this is probably the most important resource I can share with you. Um, so let's hit some questions. Thanks, Sarah, for a great presentation. Um, let's let's start with some of, some of the natural some more natural history questions. Uh, we had a question on how high in a tree egg masses are deposited. We've observed them uh, to, up into uh, the canopy. So, can you repeat that? Oh, we've observed them at, at all, all canopy heights, even into the crown. Okay. Um, and are there any native species whose egg masses could be easily confused with spotted lanternflies? If we're, you know, when we're encouraging people to go out and scrape egg masses, is there a concern that they're going to be destroying egg masses of, of desirable or beneficial or native species? Good question. I think the closest thing that looks similar to a lanternfly egg mass is probably a gypsy moth egg mass. And I would say just go ahead and kill that too. Um, but gypsy moth egg masses are have a woollier appearance while spotted lanternfly have a more of a cracked appearance. So I, I know probably some people on in the chat are entomologists themselves and they can chime in, but I'm not aware of a, a beneficial native species that has quite the same, that waxy coating with those vertical uh, structures. And also, if you're seeing a lot of egg masses, you probably already saw the insect. And so it's, you're very likely to know what it is. Okay, great. And so you, you mentioned that spider lantern fat fly is really a concern for um, some agricultural products and also for the forestry industry. 
But are we seeing large infestations happening in intact forest areas, natural areas, or are most of the, the infestations happening in more human disturbed areas, agricultural areas, farms, vineyards, orchards? I think the focus has certainly, from an identification and regulatory standpoint, has certainly been more on agricultural areas and edge habitats, but we absolutely see infestations in contiguous forest. Um, I've observed it myself. Uh, they're there. They move very effectively up the canopy, even as small nymphs. Um, and yeah, they're, they're certainly very capable of moving around in contiguous forest. Again, the, the problem is too, in, in that area of Pennsylvania, there's a huge amount of fragmentation. So it's hard to kind of chart a course and, and look at the spread over a large swath of forest. Um, but, but absolutely, we see them in contiguous forest. And are there any climatological constraints that would suggest that um, spotter and lanternfly is, is limited in its potential range? You know, is there is so, sort of a lower temperature, wintertime temperature limit, limit that the, the egg masses can tolerate? That's a good question. I think that is currently under research um, to look at egg mass temperature, I guess, persistence, I'm not sure the, the correct word to use there. Um, but I, what I can say is that, uh, let's see, let me, let me think a bit about some, what some of the researchers have told me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about a threshold temperature. I don't know if that's well established. Um, lanternfly tend to, again, lay eggs, I don't know if I said this, but in more sheltered locations. So you may have kind of a, a micro habitat where it's, it's not reaching a critically low temperature. Um, certainly some percentage of the eggs don't hatch out in a given year, but I don't have an answer for what that threshold temperature is. Um, in terms of other climatological factors, there is an issue around latitude where um, the number of growing degree days does kind of dictate how long it takes for them to begin hatching out and then how far they can get in their life cycle. Um, but Again, because you have sort of microrefugia across the landscape, differences in elevation, um, differences in temperature around urban areas, or, or um, again, if it's a, that, it more of its preferred food source, maybe it lives longer in the year than, than somewhere else. We're not sure about that yet. Um, I think that there's a, a very wide range of error, uh, margin of error for making those delineations geographically too. Okay. And, and for treatment, um, where can folks actually purchase the banding materials? Are, is that available at a hardware store? Is that something that people would have yep. to order? Yeah, the banding materials are widely available. Um, and on that banding resource that I mentioned on this website, um, it, it'll kind of outline the different options that you have. And you can also make your own bands. Um, you know, you could even use something like duct tape, but, um, but duct tape will get less sticky if it rains. So that's why it's sometimes better to go with a commercial option um, or using like a petroleum jelly, I think is one of the, one of the options that they, they offer there. So there are some DIY options, but certainly the commercial bands work a little bit better. And oh, real quick, the one thing I also want to mention in terms of contact pesticides, it's very important not to try home remedies for contact insecticides. Um, you don't really know what the effects are going to be on that insect or on non-targets or on the environment. Um, it's very important to kind of stick to the official recommendations. So continue. And what, what are the odds, would you say, on being able to totally eradicate spotter and lantern fly? Um, this also relates to a question of funding, whether there's um, federal funding like Asian longhorn beetle eradication in Massachusetts uh, or or sufficient state funding to continue the quarantine effort and, and the control efforts that are that are happening. Yeah, there is support from a variety of levels, including federal and state levels in Pennsylvania right now that's focusing not just on enforcing the quarantine, but also on um, education, some like, I think banding programs were also funded at one point. Um, and a lot of the research is funded through, through those agencies too, um, and through a lot of these cooperative efforts, right? Um, so there, there is certainly a lot of funding support. What was the first part of your question? Um, just in terms of the, oh, the, the chance of eradication. 
Right. Um, so that question is way above my pay grade. What I can say is that the language has changed from eradication among regulatory agents toward mitigation and prevent of spread, which is, I think, I think I read that as an appropriate use of language now. Um, it's out there on the landscape. And, but through the actions that we take, we can mitigate its impact and we can prevent its spread. So those two things are certainly within human power to do. I don't know whether eradication is really, if there's hope for eradication or not, but people that would be able to say that are the regulators that, that make those decisions and not me. Sure. Well, Sarah, thank you for a great presentation today. Um, members of the audience, if we didn't get to your question, I'll be sending uh, Sarah text copies of the questions, so we'll try to answer them and get them up on a slide at the end of the webinar video. We will try to get the video posted um, by the end of the day tomorrow, um, so it'll be up on our the Natural Areas Association website with a link to the YouTube video. Thanks everybody for attending. Have a great afternoon and thank you, Sarah, for a, a great informative presentation. Thank you all for participating.